So um, this is uh, <clears throat> part two of uh, embodiment and cognitive science. I'm going to kind of continue uh, the lecture that I started last time looking at this topic. So I'm going to go through, and this is kind of a just a, 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 a continuation of the uh, subjects, concepts, and topics that we were talking about then. So I'm going to start off by uh, talking about what are known as basic level categories, basic level categories. And these are the categories that develop typically most easily uh, within human persons um, early on in uh, childhood development. So, so they're categories that, that uh, develop uh, very naturally and tend to develop very easily. So uh, basic level categories, um, for the most part, categorical discrimination evolved to fit our natural environment. So if we think about the evolution of human persons, um, having, categoric, um, having different categories tended to fit the environments that we are from and the things that we needed to do as our species evolved. And so probably the most basic level category that you could see would be to uh, distinguish uh, different kinds of animals. And so we were able to distinguish really basic differences between certain animals, say like being able to distinguish between a cow, a horse, and an elephant. So, so if you think about it, from an early age, we quickly develop and are really interested in, when you think about children uh, during child development, they're very interested in different kinds of animals. Now what we have more difficulty trying to distinguish is, is different types of, say, horses, elephants, cows, so on and so forth. So the more fine distinctions within a basic level category is where we have a little bit more struggle. So the easiest category, uh, these are the easiest categories to learn in contrast to superordinate categories, uh, which would need, be more kind of broad-based or abstract categories, such as animals, and then as subordinate categories which are the categories of kind of the more fine distinctions between different kinds of horses or different kinds of cats, um, et cetera, et cetera. So some, there's some basic properties to these basic level categories. One is for the most part, the highest level represented by, um, tends to be represented by a single mental, Im uh, a single mental image. So if I say something like a horse, we tend to have an image of that horse in our mind. Um, whereas if you were to state the category animal, for the most part, there isn't really an image of that because an animal takes up so many different uh, kinds of basic level categories. So we don't really have a specific image that's associated with that. So um, the way in which these categories get built um, are based on perceived visual similarities. And so you can maybe see where the embodiment is coming in. These categories begin, these, these basic level categories begin based on the very uh, primary visual distinctions there are between, say, for example, a horse, um, an elephant, a cat, so on and so forth. And then we begin to develop these categories based on things that are very similar. So for example, horses have manes, they have four legs, they have a long face, so on and so forth. There's all these different similarities, visual similarities to this category of horse. Um, it's also the case when you think about, when we move on to different objects that we see, basic level categories tend to be categories that we have similar motor actions when we're interacting with that thing. Say for example, um, a chair has a very common motor action for sitting. So the category of chair is more that basic level category because chairs tend to have four legs. We tend to sit in those, seen those, seen those kinds of, uh, we tend to sit in chairs. So we have a basic, um, motor memory system that's involved in the ways in which we sit in chairs. Um, whereas when you go to a more superordinate category, such as furniture, furniture doesn't really have anything 
um, motor related that applies to all different kinds of furniture, be that tables, beds, so on and so forth. So um, most of our categorical knowledge tends to be organized and tends to be much more intuitive at this kind of base level or this basic level of categories. So where these basic uh, level categories start at is a type of schema. We've talked about schemas before in this class. So um, schemas are uh, is a representation of members of a particular category and the schema has different slots that are filled based on what it is that we're looking at. Um, so it's based on what type of objects they are, the parts that they tend to have, and their typical properties. So for example, if we had um, an animal schema, there tends to be certain slots that we'd fill in terms of what they look like, how many, um, how many uh, legs does it have, does it have hands or not? How does it walk? We have certain kind of slots that fill up what, the, uh, what each basic level type of horse or dog or cat actually is based on this type of schema that we have. Um, so I'll skip, I'll skip this little bit about schema we're kind of going over that before. So um, what this leads us to is, is different sorts of spatial relations concepts different sorts of spatial relations concepts. And these are what are known as embodied schemas. So some of our schemas are based on spatial relations. So for example, one of these kinds of concepts is a container. So when we describe certain kinds of things, when we're trying to describe something, we often use this idea of a container as a way to explain certain kinds of things. So a container is based on a, round, it's in a bounded region in space. So there is definitely something that is, there's an inside, there's an outside, there's a separation between what's inside and what's outside. Uh, there's some kind of boundary there. And a container, which is something that, once again, from early on, uh, we are interacting with different kinds of containers. Say, for example, young children, uh, one of the things that they love more than anything is a box. They love to explore the box. Uh, see what's going on inside the box, what's, a, what's, oh, what's going on outside the box. And so that may be part of the reason why, or it's part of the reason why these kinds of categories or this container schema tends to come to us so easily and so quickly. Um, so for the container schema, uh, uh, sensory motor experiences are the organizing scaffolding for concepts and words that we use. So the word in functions grammatically according to the container schema. So we talk of persons falling in love. So when you're in love, you're inside the container. Or we talk about persons falling out of love. Or, um, and so when you are no longer in that state, then you are outside of the container. Children get into trouble um, or they get out of trouble. And so what we're doing is we're using this kind of container as a kind of in some ways really kind of a basic level or a, as a type of, it's a type of schema, and then we use that schema to describe all other kinds of things. Um, so when you're inside the container, that means that you're holding the property, say of being in love, and when you're outside the container, you are no longer um, holding that property of love and thus you are no longer in that state anymore. And that's one of the reasons why we use those kinds of words like in and out to describe spatial relations uh, that we have early on. All of, us, um, all of us, for the most part, experience these kinds of spatial relations, and that's where some of this language that we use actually emerges from. Um, so another um, aspect of the container schema is the self as a container. So it's located, um, so the self is located in a container, so control of the subject by the self. Um, things that are not located in the container are out of control of the self. So if we think of things like, I was beside myself, um, he is out to lunch, meaning he's not really um, paying attention. I'm out of it today. Are you out of your mind? 
we use these things as when you aren't in the proper state of selfhood, when you aren't fully in control, then you are outside of this container schema, or what we're using this container schema as a way to describe these kinds of things, these kinds of more abstract um, personality characteristics that we observe. So all complex metaphors are made up of primary or atomic metaphors. These metaphors are based on sensor motor experiences that shape or act as a schema for language and concepts that we have. Um, all concepts are based on common bodily experiences that we have among humans. So these spatial relations concepts give us the start of these kind of primary metaphors that we tend to use. And these primary metaphors are once again based on these kinds of bodily experiences that we have. So for example, intimacy is closeness. The subjective of experience we have is intimacy. The sensor motor experience that we have is being physically close. And um, this really goes back to, or is related to that concept from the, from the last lecture, where we called people warm if uh, we felt close to them or, or we liked their personality. It's the same sort of thing. When we feel intimate with someone, we feel close to them. Uh, there's something about physical proximity is the um, experience that we all commonly have um, that we use to describe something like emotional intimacy. And that's where it comes from. People who we are close to, we tend to be in close physical proximity to. People who we feel distant to, people who we don't know um, or understand, tend to be further away. So the example that we give here, we've been close for years, but now we are starting to drift apart. So because, of, uh, because some of these more abstract concepts like love and like intimacy are often difficult for us to, to describe, we use more basic kinds of sensory motor experiences, such as distance, such as closeness, such as further feeling further away, to describe what these things are like. So we've been close for years, seems to indicate that, that this couple were close or were very intimate, but now we're starting to drift apart. So, uh, so once again, the primary experience here is being physically close to people you are intimate with. So it is the basic sensory motor experience that gets mapped onto something that's slightly more abstract, which is things like intimacy and love. Another really simple one um, and uh, somewhat basic to who we are um, is something like bad is stinky. When we don't, the feeling we have of disgust is usually associated with things that we don't like. So the subjective judgment is evaluation. The sensory motor domain is smell. So the example is this movie stinks. Um, the primary experience is being repelled by foul smelling objects. And so um, for the most part, we have this very, we have an evolved system, an evolved disgust system that um, we use to um, smell out uh, different, different uh, potential dangers, be that food or otherwise. And so then that basic level system also gets mapped onto other sorts of things that we either like, um, that we either like or dislike. Well, in this case, it would be primarily disliking something. So something that we don't like, we get a sense of disgust from. Um, we see them as vile. And that comes from that kind of sensory motor uh, disgust reflex that all human beings have. Interestingly, um, that's also one of the ways um, this same kind of sensory motor experience is also the ways that we um, understand and feel the emotions of others. So one study that was done uh, back in 2003 by uh, Wicker um, and their colleagues was that they did an a, a fMRI analysis during the observation of disgust. So persons would watch three different kinds of persons, um, 
uh, smelling a particular um, glass or a clear glass, and then they noted what kinds of areas of the brain became activated when they were looking at something and, it, and either gave a pleasurable facial expression, neutral facial expression, or a dis, or a or a um, a facial a facial expression of disgust. And what they found is the fMRI analysis demonstrated an overlap in the areas activated during the observation of disgust and the actual experience of disgust. Um, this was the primary anterior insula and the partially anterior cingulate cortex. And you remember, we've talked a little bit about this before when we were talking about mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are neurons that are activated both in the observation of something and the performance of that action. It seems to be that there are similar circuits in terms of things like emotion, especially something like uh, disgust. And the idea is when you observe someone who is, um, uh, see, when you observe someone in disgust, the same areas of the brain become activated when you yourself are experiencing disgust. And that is that way in which, probably in which, empathy works. When we're feeling something from someone else, we're experiencing something that we understand, um, in this case, what someone else is actually thinking. So we perceive emotions by activating the same emotions in ourselves. We understand what someone else's emotions are by actually having that emotional experience ourselves. The same thing occurs in terms of disgust. So we observe disgust in someone else, um, automatically retrieves a neural representation of that disgust as well. So once again, how does, how does this apply to kind of this embodiment sort of idea that we've been talking about? We can think about it in terms of morality. Where do our moral laws and our moral values and our moral judgments actually come from? Uh, one model of this is based, on, is based on the work of Jonathan Haidt, and he has what's called uh, the social intuitionist model. And he argues that, mo uh, that moral categories are based on embodied experience, such as disgust. So things that we dislike morally Things that we fall, uh, things that we find morally reprehensible, actually activate um, our own disgust response in us. And and, and what's and what this does is it it takes um, moral let's see moral displeasure or things that we find morally reprehensible make use of the universal features of the disgust mechanism that happens. Uh, for all humans, all humans have some sort of a disgust response. Um, everyone has smelled something disgusting in their lives. And actually, our moral apprehension or our moral repulsion to something develops or becomes uh, linked with this particular category. Um, so moral, uh, moral categories become abstracted from these more base level sorts of embodied experiences. And what Haidt would argue is, you know, the moral laws and the moral rules that we develop actually come out of or emerge from these more basic level bodily sorts of um, experiences that the human uh, person has. And that's where we see things as disgusting or we see someone as morally uh, disgusting because we are feeling something discussing about that person and then mapping that on to the um, our moral uh, our moral uh, revulsion of what it is that they're actually doing now a second set of uh, second set of motor actions that uh, might apply to this idea of knowledge understanding is uh, this common experience of grasping all of us know how to grasp something Grasping is a normal part of, of what happens for most I mean, human beings. So the subjective judgment is uh, comprehension. The sensor demote, uh, I'm sorry, the sensory motor domain is object manipulation. So the example is I've never been able to grasp statistics. And the idea is I've never been able to understand statistics. 
And once again, the inability to grab something or um, when you don't, so when you're not able to reach something, when something is out of reach, you're unable to grasp it, becomes mapped on to this idea of a conceptual understanding of how statistics works. And I'm sure none of you would say, especially if you've taken my statistics class, you would never say you weren't able to grasp statistics, um, but maybe prior to taking my class, maybe you had more difficulty grasping statistics. Sorry about that horrible joke, let's move on. Okay. So it's the same thing that we use. Basic sensor motor experience gets mapped on to something more abstract. And that's because from an early age, we're getting information about objects by grasping it and by manipulating it. If we think again once more to um, early childhood development, excuse me, one of the things that kids like to do more than anything is grab whatever is around them. And look at it, feel it, movement, see how heavy it is, can they throw it? And uh, so one of the things you do with a young infant is you give them all kinds of objects to play with. Or um, if you're needing to distract your child for a few minutes, what do you usually do? You give them a key um, or your key ring and they'll start to look at it. And so part of our basic human development is interacting with objects to understand them. And so that early experiential component of understanding that's involved in grasping gets mapped onto more abstract sorts of things like statistics or history or mathematics or whatever it might be. So um, early childhood exploration. Um, basic aspect of early, of early childhood is this idea of exploration. Uh, most infants and children regularly pick up and manipulate the objects around him. Uh, in fact, most of the time, these objects tend to go, in, uh, tend to go uh, inside their mouths. And thus, this early experience of manipulation of objects becomes this basis, uh, I'm sorry, becomes the basis for our schema for knowledge and whether or not we understand something or not. Okay, um, another example of, um, of this is the source path goal schema. So many of the schemas we use are based on spatial locations and movement. So these typically contain a, a source, a starting location, uh, secondly a goal, your intended destination, and finally C, a path which is the route from the source to the goal. And so thus we're using once again a spatial model to understand certain sorts of things. One of the um, primary ways that this is often used is with the concept of love. So lovers are often, uh, are often understood as travelers. Uh, their, their common life goals are often understood as destinations. The relationship is a type of vehicle that they are in and trying to get to. Um, the difficulties are often seen as impediments to their motion or their ability to move. So when we think about this in terms of sayings that are done, uh, couples will often say things like, look how far we've come. It's been a long, bumpy road in our relationship. Uh, we're heading in different directions when things aren't going as well. We may have to go our separate ways um, if a relationship is ending. And find the relationship is not going anywhere. So once again, it's this idea of using spatial metaphors to understand something slightly more abstract, which in this case would be love. All right, so that's part two of embodiment and cognitive science. Hope you enjoyed the lecture, and uh, I'll talk to you soon.